Okay. Okay. Hello, everybody. It's really a, a pleasure to have here today with us Jesus Tola for this seminar. Uh, most of you know him. Uh, he obtained his PhD here in 2014 before he got his uh, master's degree at uh, Institute of uh, Radio Astronomy and Astrophysics, IRIA in Morelia, uh, Mexico, under the supervision of Jane Arthur. Uh, here he was working on simulations and, and X ray observation of uh, wind blown bubbles, cooperated bubbles, mostly on planetary nibbling. And since here he moved to Taiwan on a postdoctoral position, a distinguished postdoc from 2015 to 2000. 17, and then he, he keep around the world, going back to, to Morelia, where he's now a full professor at the IRIA. Uh, he, he, he funded there the group for stellar uh, astronomy. Um, and under this umbrella, he's already uh, supervised the work of three postdocs and supervised two uh, PhD uh, students. Uh, we were recently in Poland, in Krakow, in a meeting on planetary nebula, where he was walk, walk, talking about uh, the formation of ring and spirals around planetary nebulae. And now here he's going to a different, completely different topic. This is something very uh, I would say spectacular about Jesus that he's able to do simulations and observation and work on really very different uh, astrophysical objects making connections. So let's enjoy his talk. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Let me just try this. It works. Um, so yeah, so I'm Jesus Tola. I was a student here actually the last time that I was standing basically in this auditorium was, was when I defended my PhD thesis in October 2014. I've been giving other seminars in other places in the Institute, but I'm very happy to be here. Um, today, I wanna to talk to you about uh, some, a project that I've been developing in the past three years, more or less, in which we are trying to make connections between the X-ray emission from uh, active galactic nuclei and symbiotic stars. Um, of course, some part of this work has been done in collaboration with other people in Mexico, in the United States, uh, so this is the list. So the talk uh, will be addressing, uh, I will just give you a brief introduction of what an AGN is and the X-ray properties of AGNs. Uh, hopefully you will learn something from this. Um, I will tell you what are symbiotic stars, which I'll be, I will be a brief with this, S-Y-S-T, symbiotic star. I will give you a review of what the X-ray properties of symbiotic stars are, and then I will give you, um, I will present what we've been doing for these objects in the past years. Uh, so let me just uh, start by telling you, this is how, like, so the AGN people came up with an excellent idea to explain almost anything they see in uh, active galactic nuclei from optical, infrared, x-rays to optical. And what they, uh, what they tell us whenever we look in a book or a paper is that we have a supermassive black hole accreting material from the host galaxy. It is a dusty ridge, neutral torus, and then we have a collection of uh, fast moving clouds and a, a slower moving cloud. And then we have this uh, jet. Um, and depending on the viewing angle, we, we see different properties from these objects. And then they can explain a variety of observations, which I think is very clever. So this is just a video that I found in Twitter from this account. So this is supposed to be a massive, a supermassive black hole, accretive material, and then producing this torator accretion disk, very likely, and then the jets. So this is just a, it's not an actual physical simulation, it's just a, a cartoon. So you see that the material is moving uh, and it's being accreted towards the supermassive black hole. So in X-rays, um, this is uh, this is just a cartoon or a representation of the X-ray emission from uh, AGNs. Uh, in X-ray astronomy, we instead of wavelength, we we have energy and then some emission measure. 
So there's several components that these people come up with well, after studying X-ray, uh, AGNs in X-rays. So the main thing here is that they have a power law, which is the result of contabilization from this X-ray corona here. So, and then they have this soft thermal excess and then a reflection bump, which is caused by the presence of this toroidal or accretion disk around the uh, supermassive black. And then of course, the whole spectrum is a combination of everything we see here. So it's contribution from the soft excess might be due to the presence of uh, stars, stellar winds, the jet might be emitting thermal X-rays. Um, and this is a video that I found very interesting for our case of symbiotic stars. So this is the same spectrum, but um, changing the extinction. So practically the density of this toroidal structure, this, this like structure. So you can see that the, the larger the extinction, the soft X-ray range is easily absorbed by this um, material. And then we see some presence of emission lines. Uh, and this, the, this is the iron line, which is 6.4 kilo electron volt, which I will be mentioning a lot during this talk, uh, is you can see is the result of the reflection component. And then uh, here are the, the different uh, components, thermal emissions, scattered component, the reflection, and some high energy could after they call because of the presence of this contamination or non-thermal emission. And these are just two examples of uh, X-ray spectra from two different, two AGNs from this paper published this year. So you see the soft emission and then the, uh, the, well, the component, the Compton emission, the Compton component, the iron lines, which we show here. And actually these are three lines. This is the 6.4 line, which is the fluorescent line, 6.7 and 6.97 kilo electron volt. The other two lines are produced uh, by the presence of a hot gas by extremely high emission status of iron. Uh, and then you see it, it extends up to 100 kilo electron volts. Okay, now after I told you what an AGN looks like in X-rays, so what are symbiotic stars? So symbiotic stars are and by the recent definition is that any system, a compact object that is accreting material from a red giant component. So this means that the compact object actually can be a white dwarf, a stellar black hole, or a neutron star. It can have either of these three accreting material from a red giant star. Um, and this is how, what we think a symbiotic nebula associated to a symbiotic star should look like. Uh, because of uh, conservation of angular momentum, the ejection of the, the material might be might have this hourglass structure. This is actually a, an object that has been classified as a planetary nebula, but now we think it's a symbiotic. Actually, we are still don't not sure about the origin of this material. Um, so during this talk, I will be referring to a symbiotic stars to the specific case of uh, accreting uh, white dwarfs and. I guess I don't have to convince you that white dwarfs, accreting white dwarfs, are interesting in different uh, areas of astronomy. In particular, for example, in cosmology, they are used as uh, standard candles for estimating distances to other galaxies. So let me start by uh, talking about um, our query, which is one of is, is actually the only definite symbiotic star that uh, can be resolved, that we can resolve the nebula. It's actually very close. It's about 200 parsecs from us. And this is an um, astronomy picture of the day image from 2017. And in red, you see the optical emission from H alpha and nitrogen two. And then in blue is the X-ray emission detected from Chandra. So you see this kind of like a jet here that's easily spotted by the X-rays and then some emission, nebular emission. In 2018, uh, Tina Limit uh, published a very interesting paper on the, the extended morphology of the nebular emission, which I show you here. These are images obtained with VLT. This is the H alpha nitrogen two line, uh, the oxygen one, two, and three filters. And then you can, of course, see again the kind of like the jet. It it looks like it's a processing jet, and then it's very for. For me, it was very illustrative. This is kind of like bowl-shaped structures like this. And then we see several arms projecting in the plane of the sky. 
So this, these are easily uh, spotted in the bottom left panel of this figure. Um, this is a color composite image, just uh, combining the H alpha nitrogen two filter, the oxygen two in green and the oxygen three in blue. So it's, it's actually more complex than we could ever imagine. Uh, I, I forgot to tell you, but whenever you want to stop me, please ask me a question. I, I'm happy if you interrupt me. Um, and it has, there's never been a nitrodynamical model of this object, although, because as you can see, when we can resolve more details of objects, it's the most difficult to uh, go into the details. But in, 2000, in 1992, uh, Heaney and Dyson proposed some analytical modeling to explain this bowl-shaped cavities as an hourglass. Uh, and this is just a comparison, uh, top right panel, a uh, comparison of the model that I just overplot on the optical image. So you can see it's a relatively good one. Um, and, but what about the jet? We, I've been talking about this jet, it's a processing jet. And of course, uh, I haven't said anything further than that. Um, so these are HSD observations of this object. So this is clearly a processing thing on, in the planet sky. Uh, so what do we know about the jet? So the jet is actually, as I told you, it emits an X-rays. So it means that we have at least this jet expands with a hundred of kilometers per second in order to uh, be detected by X-rays. And actually after the analysis of the X-ray spectrum of this jet, we can conclude that the dominant plasma temperature, which is 90 per 97% of the total flux is 1 million Kelvin degrees. And then some extra contribution from a little bit uh, um, hotter component. You can see here is the dark blue line is the main component and some extra component here for the higher energies. Uh, then of, we started up because Marisa Botello is a master's student in UNA. So she, her thesis was to look for new symbiotic stars. And one of the things, so we wanted to search all of the archives, X-ray archives, infrared, uh, optical, everything. Uh, and then one of the nice surprises is that uh, we found out that there were 2005 observations of the R. These were archival data, unpublished and archival data. So this is how, our query looks in X-rays. It's the blue emission here. Uh, this is one arc minute, and the spatial resolution of the XMM Newton is about six arc seconds. And this is just a comparison between XMM and the Chandra observation. So you can tell Chandra is more or less blind to the extended emission, but it, it can map in detail with the resolution is about one arc second. So both telescopes are complementary. So the interesting thing with the XMM Newton is that the X-ray emission uh, is delimited by the optical bowl shapes, this bowl cavities. So um, af after giving it a thought and what is happening here, so, and then, uh, sorry, the temperature of the extended emission detected by XMM is also 1 million degrees. So the same gas that is outflowing through the jet is feeding out the most extended uh, regions. Uh, and this is the best model that I could come up with uh, to explain what is happening in our query. So what I think is happening is that the jet is blowing up. It's hot. The pressure is high. So the jet is disrupting into the, these bipolar cavities. And then each time the jet is disrupted, it fits the extended emission. And then it creates this ball, different ball shapes, morphologies. This is what I think is happening. My hydro, hydro model supports me, <laughs> you can tell. Um, so yeah, but more physically, so what I think is happening is the same mechanism that it's taking place in AGNs, in active galactic nuclei. So we are feeding an extended hot bubble with a jet. It's exactly the same. So some other people have been claiming this for a lot of um, uh, binaries, uh, AGNs, particularly in um, soccer. And um, yeah, so what about other uh, symbiotic systems? So our query, we can see everything in it, but what about the other ones? So this is um, how they look. These are four examples of how they how symbiotic systems look. 
Uh, is, these are the four points in the central images. On the left, you see two objects that look red because of the uh, red giant component. And then on the right, uh, and these are optical images. On the right, they actually look blue because the white dwarf is dominating the emission that uh, the emission that uh, arrives to the telescope. Uh, so in our galaxy, we have found definite detections of about 300 symbiotic systems, uh, white dwarf accreting symbiotic systems. And only about 60% or 60 of them uh, have been detected in X-rays. We don't know why. There might be, it might be because they are the closest one, or as you will see, they're oriented, uh, pointing towards us. So how does other systems other than our query look like in X-rays? So in 1997, Merced uh, used uh, Rosat observations, which had a very restricted uh, energy range for observing the X-ray universe between about 0.4 or 0.2 up to 2.5 kilo electron volts. And after um, observing about 20 or 30 sources, they, they were able to give a classification depending on the spectrum that they detected. So they gave the alpha type to those sources that were extremely soft, something that is dominated below 0.5 kilo electron volt. The beta type, it's something that has a peak between 0.5 and 1. And the gamma type is anything that it's brighter in energies larger than one. It's very simple. The classification is just a, a hardness ratio. Um, you can tell it's softer and harder uh, spectra. But just you can tell. So this looks like nothing like AGN thus far in 1997. So AGNs are extremely bright. That's why we detect a lot of photons. For those people who don't know, X-ray telescopes count photons. So actually, each one of these is a collection of, uh, of photons, and these are practically photon star observations. But later, with the new generation of X-ray satellites, um, people found out that some of these uh, sources actually emit uh, harder X-ray emission. These are swift observations of these three sources, and you can tell uh, for example, this uh, this Henais 3461, it looked like nothing in the previous classification. So a new class had to be included, which is the delta type, surprisingly. And this looks more like an AGN, if you remember my first spectra of AGNs, and actually has the iron line here, or the iron complex, unresolved iron complex. And then they also suggested that there were some other cases let me see if I can move this. No. Anyway. I feel, there it is. Huh. So these two on the right, they classified as beta delta type spectra because they share properties of both beta and delta type. So this was just, again, uh, classification, taking a look at the spectrum. So where, uh, so now we need so in order to explain why we see different X-ray spectra from the symbiotic sources. So the first one, the alpha type, it has been explained as um, accretion directly onto the white dwarf. So when the material comes directly into the, into the surface of the white dwarf, it is shocked. So um, gravitational energy is converted into heat. So we have some soft emission. And in some cases where the white dwarf might have a, a magnetic field, of course, it is uh, directed towards the magnetic line. So we wouldn't see any difference because at the end, we see a shock on the surface of the white dwarf. So this is the explanation for the alpha type. Um, the beta type, it is always attributed to the presence of jets or winds from the white dwarf. The white dwarf might not be very evolved and might have a stellar wind, or the accretion this, or, or the, the star might be producing a jet. And, and this might be shocking the atmosphere of the extended red companion. This is, this is an illustration that I just took from internet, but this companion does not look extended. The red giants are extended and they have a extended atmosphere. So shocks are easy to claim for the beta type because we, you need a little bit of extinction, but higher temperatures. 
And so this is just what we see in our query. And the last one is uh, the delta is evidently the same because due to a uh, reflection component. So people have claimed that there's a thin disk and then the hottest gas is here, but because we are also surrounded by the extinction from the companion, the red companion, so we the soft component is absorbed and we only see the harder part, but we see the iron uh, line in the spectrum. And of course, the beta and delta type are just a combination of whatever we see with the other two. Uh, so one of the things that we do in x-rays is because we usually have, not in NGNs, in other, any other field, we, we have photon star spectra. So what we try to do is we compare, in order to explain what we see, we compare models with the spectra. So we actually, for example, in the left panel, as I show you, this is the dotted line, fits the soft part. But I also need another harder, more extinguished component in order to fit the other one. So I start adding up components until I, my residuals are more or less flat. In this case, you might tell that there, there was no need to add this Gaussian to, in order to fit the iron line, but it is there. And Here's another example to the right where they fit uh, most of the spectrum with a, a very high temperature. And then the iron lines are model setting up uh, three iron lines for the three ones. This is not, um, this is only to produce an accepted fit, it's just to make the residuals go to zero or close to zero. But this is not an actually a physical model of the emission. And they're all produced or performed with solar bundles. Okay, so this uh, is the first uh, case that started at all. Uh, so this is CH Cygni. This is one of the most observed uh, symbiotic stars um, in our galaxy. And has, it has been observed by almost any X-ray mission uh, from Exosat, Rosat, Aska, Susaku, Changa, XMM. There's like available X-ray spectra and information from almost every of these uh, telescopes. And these are old observations from 1998 and 2007 from two different telescopes. This is the ASCA telescope and SUSAR. And you can tell it looks like any other uh, beta delta type uh, symbiotic star that I showed you. We need some soft emission and then a hard emission, extinguished hard emission. And here the authors fit a broad Gaussian in order to fit the three components. Spectral resolution was not very good, so they just fit something, the most simple model. In the other case, components are not plotted, but it's very similar to this one. Um, so in 2006, there was a paper which has been ignored for so very long time, where they compared this object, CH Cygni, with three safer two galaxies. You can tell on the top, there's the, uh, I think it's the ASCA spectrum of CH Cygni. In the other three panels are um, X-ray spectra from safer two galaxies. If I will erase the labels on the names, you wouldn't even tell which object is which one. So, and actually the intensities are more or less the same, although they're located at different distances. But they're very close, they're very uh, similar. So, Whitley and Coleman proposed that similarly to AGNs, uh, CH Cygni should have a reflection component. This was one of the first work that addressed this problem. Uh, I won't go into the details because in that model, they just have uh, some component that is causing the reflection, but it has no morphology, no covering angle, no nothing. But if you want to take a look at the paper, there it is. So what we did is we took all the available XMM, Newton, and Chandra observations of this object. Uh, to see uh, what we could say about this source. Uh, so the first thing is that they were a, a high resolution uh, X-ray spectra from this source. On the top, these are RGS uh, spectra of the, uh, in the soft energy band. And on the bottom, there's some uh, Chandra HEG of, uh, spectra from the harder part of the emission. And we can resolve very nice with the three iron lines, and then some other emission lines in the soft range. So the first thing that we did is 
it was we computed the abundances of the X-ray emitting gas actually for the first time in a symbiotic star. So, and the abundances are very close to the material or the abundances of the red giant companion we can find in the literature. So we just confirmed that the X-ray emission is material that the white dwarf is accreting from the red giant companion. Nobody has done that before, but I don't think there was a uh, doubt on that. And then here, I wanna show you how many components we need in order to perform similar uh, spectral fits. Uh, if we account for the same um, procedure that has been done in the past. So I hope you can differentiate the different colors. This is done to confuse the enemy. Uh, so the, <laughs> the softer uh, temperatures, 0 0.18, 0 0.67, is the first and the second component. So we need uh, uh, this yellow component, 8.1. It fits and it's heavily extinguished. It's, it fits one of the iron lines. We need a Gaussian for the fluorescent line, the six point, there is. And then it was evident that there was something in the middle that we were not able to model. So none of the previous authors um, suggested there was some extra component that we needed in order to perform to have an acceptable, statistically acceptable uh, model. So here is just an attempt to model this intermediate range with a very hard, uh, high uh, temperature. And actually 55 is just telling us that the software is not able to fit. It's just telling us that something there is not able to fit, fit uh, uh, a physical parameter. So the other one is just exchange this uh, intermediate uh, energy or temperature with a power law component. So you can tell there's also, uh, it, it may stop also fitting or the intermediate energy range. The other components remained more or less the same with the uh, error bars. And the last one, we use one of those AGN models, which is called uh, Feather Bexrap. And I, this model uh, assumes that the, this uh, toroid, toroidal structure, but that is a neutral, uh, neutral component because in AGNs, there's a lot of dust. So it's more or less neutral. Again, it's also statistically acceptable. Model. So you can tell the three of them, uh, we cannot differentiate any, any from the three of them. So as uh, a summary from this analysis, so we found out that, that we need two soft components, very um, slightly extinguished, something hard on the right, heavily extinguished. So you can tell that the extinction is like about more than two orders of magnitude larger in the this temperature, and then something in the middle that we cannot statistically say which of these three are is. And the total luminosity of this object is about one solar luminosity in X-rays. Um, as a curious observation, uh, a note, uh, this is again the same spectrum, CH Cygni, uh, as observed by XM and Newton. And so the next thing I did was to take the only observation of our query, like this guy here. And then I extracted the spectrum of everything, included the central source, the jet, the extended emission. And this is how it looks like. It's very similar to see Sydney. It's not exactly the same, but you can tell it, it also looks like a, a safer to galaxy, like an AGM object. So it means that if I take into account every component, the spatial, the jets, the bubble, and the central engine, I will have something like this, a beta delta type uh, source, which for me was revealing. And after that, I started like going into all the X-ray observations of the symbiotic stars. They started looking at very objects like this. So it means that whenever we see beta delta type, we are, because these are unresolved sources, we are including everything into our spectrum. Um, so the first thing we did, or, uh, or the best thing we were able to achieve uh, for these observations, um, was to use this code uh, reflex, which is usually um, used for uh, study AGNs. So we, uh, and it includes the reflection from a central source, we need to uh, define some structure, which is, a, this was a thin disk, it was just a, a, some fishing expedition we needed to do. 
Uh, we define the, the density of the disk with a uh, column density, some radius for the disk, a thickness, and we we said that the X-ray luminosity of the source should be something like what we just uh, calculated from our models. Uh, so this uh, code is able to trace the X-ray photons, and then depending on the inclination, it can give us uh, uh, models that we can compare to with our actual data. And this is what we uh, have. Again, the first two soft temperatures, we still need them. These two, the 0 0.18, 0 0.7, reproduce the X-ray emission down to, let's say, one kilo electron volt. Very nicely, the two of them with a relatively low extinction. And then we have, again, a hot component, about 6.6 .6 kilo electron volt to fit the harder component. And I will show you in the next slide that it also fits the two iron lines, the, the, the highly ionized iron lines. And then the reflection that is produced by this disk naturally produces the iron 6.4 uh, kilo electron line and then some soft emission because of the reflection. Uh, these are just the parameters that, of the best fit, the extension, the temperature, and then the thickness of the. So we actually found out that most of the physics of the reflection is happening very close to the star. It's just uh, the inner part of this disk. The rest of the disk does not collaborate. Of course, it also depends in the inclination, as I will, I will show you later. So this is a close-up of the um, energy range, including the three iron lines. Uh, you can tell the reflection completely reproduces. So the black solid line here is the uh, combination of all of the total model. The orange is the reflection component and the yellowish beige is the contribution from the two other iron lines. So we were very happy because with an AGN uh, tool, we were able to explain a symbiotic uh, spectrum. But one of the things that we actually uh, were puzzled by is that uh, some other X-ray uh, observations um, have demonstrated that the iron lines are actually changing with time. So sometimes the fluorescent line is dominating and sometimes the ionized uh, gas is dominating. In the 2006 Sackle observations, you can tell the 6.4, which is the fluorescent line is dominating. And then in our Chandra 2009 uh, is the ionized iron, which is clearly dominating. And then in the two, they're more or less the same intensity, the two lines. So this means at this point, we were just able to say that the accretion disk, it might be changing, or it might be due to the period of the red giant star, because some other people already estimated that the actual uh, uh, equivalent width of the fluorescent line depends on the, this is like a covering angle, and then the extinction. So we can only say to, as far is that the disk or the ambient is changing with time. So we couldn't do anything further with our model. But this was something that we suggested in this, this work. Um, so the other thing is that uh, I've been working lately is because after I started reducing and working with a lot of X-ray data, I found out that some of these sources actually, when you observe them, they, they have a certain type and after some time they have another type, another X-ray type. So I will show you here, this is uh, T Corona Borealis and I will show you a GIF that it, it will show different spectra from different uh, years. And then you will see that this source comes, goes from a beta type into a beta delta type. This is a spectrum, so immediately goes, uh, produces this soft X-ray emission. And then when the soft X-ray emission goes up, the hard emission goes down, and then it goes back again. One more time. And then when it's back, suddenly has another ejection and then goes down again. So these classification scheme, uh, saying that this is a beta, this is alpha, whatever, it's not a definite thing. So we actually, um, so this is just a comparison of all spectra. You can tell from a beta type with no soft emission, we go into ejections and then luminosity goes up and down. So we have lots of physics. And then when we try to concentrate in the, in the high energy part, we see the same thing. So actually the, let's say the, 
uh, pendiente, I forgot this, uh, the slope, the slope <laughs> of the high energy range. It also changes at the same time that the luminosity changes. So there's something intrinsically, physically uh, happening in this force. So the classification scheme is not a definite thing. So we need something more fundamental to explain the extra emission. So something we can say, we can uh, use to explain all the variety of the X-ray spectrum. So these are just another two examples of how symbiotic stars look in X-rays. So this is KT Eridanen. So the, it has a soft X-ray emission in the 2011, and then the hard goes down. And then by 2018, the soft emission goes down, but the hard emission goes high a little bit. It's, it's, it can be seen by the eye. And then this guy here, it is the weirdest thing that I've ever seen. It's actually classified as an AGN star, but it's definitely not an AGN. So AGNs cannot produce X-ray emission. So you can tell that by 2013, this the darker uh, emission, it, there's no soft emission. Actually, there's not even iron line here, iron lines. And then suddenly soft emission, and then the iron line comes up. So when we explain this, this, uh, resources. So something that I've been doing recently is um, try to come up with a unified model to explain the extra emission from all symbiotic stars, which is similarly as AGNs. Um, so I've been using the SCIRT code that uh, very recently in the version nine includes the tradity transfer from X-ray photons. So I've been trying to make this easy for now to just to try to explain if I can reproduce different spectra with just a, a, sim, a single toroidal structure. Um, so I have, this is my, my toy model where I have an inner ring, it's a flare disc. I have an inner ring, an outer ring. Um, I can define the orbital plane. The disc is also defi uh, defined by a um, uh, density. Uh, I have an open, opening angle and then the, uh, the angle to the observer. So I, I can be seen from the, uh, face on or edge on. And then I use Particularly, I use one, which is the, the high energy temperature, but I also will show you some combinations of the two, a soft and a hard, and then just a soft emission. And these are produced in XPEC, which is an X-ray tool. And then I just make these tables and fit skirt into the simulation. Uh, so this is just an example of what skirt can report to the user. Uh, this is a um, model with uh, just the, the hottest temperature, an inner uh, ring with one astronomical unit at an inclination of 80 uh, degrees. This is the uh, column density. And then I think the outer radius is about 200 uh, astronomical units. So uh, as a result, skirt gives me uh, the transparent uh, flux, which is this one, which well, I will be seeing if there were no disk at all. And then the primary, which is the green one, is what how I look my hot plasma after being extinguished by the disk. And then the yellow one is the scatter. So the scattered photons that go into the disk and they're scattered in different directions. And some photons lose energy and they produce this soft X-ray emission. And then of course, the dark lane here is just the total, what I will be seeing after the light leaves the disk. So just by um, putting a disk, I can reproduce a delta uh, symbiotic star just by extinction. You can see the three lines, the three iron lines, and actually the fluorescent line is produced in the scattered light, X-ray light. So this was the first step, it, it was easy. And then I started, uh, I wanted to see how different parameters affect the X-ray emission that I see. Uh, so I made, uh, I vary different parameters, the inner, the inner radius, the uh, opening angle, the density of the disk, and the plasma of the, of the point source that I'm modeling. So you can tell, uh, for example, uh, one of the main results here is that the extinction is what causes that the uh, intensity of the iron lines to change in time. So you can tell by a heavily extinguished gas, the fluorescent line dominates, something that is five times 10 to the 24, it has similar uh, emission uh, flux from the three iron lines. And then for lower extinction density, column densities, it has if the, the ionized line dominates again. So I can explain this just by changing 
the extinction. So that means that if we have a binary system, so the density in the disk or the atmosphere of the star is changing with that in order to explain the variation of the iron lines. Um, different, for example, um, temperatures of the inner source uh, will predict different fluxes in the higher energy flux, which this can be corroborated by uh, new star observations. For example, some of these symbiotic stars have new star observations, swift observations. So this could be later corroborated or not. And then the opening angle produces a similar effect as the given angle. And the inner radius produces the same bump, but the inner uh, scattered light changes in flux. Of course, if I, after this, I uh, multiply, uh, take into account the, uh, um, the instrumental matrices, you can tell this flux is very low in, on the soft part, so it will not be detected. And this will change. Um, this will be kind of like delta type observations. So the, and this is a comparison with um, having just one temperature, the, the hot temperature, and a combination of a soft and a high uh, temperature. So when the inclination angle is high in order to produce the reflection, I do not see a soft component. I wouldn't see any soft component. And they actually look the same. So whenever I see alpha type symbiotic stars, it should be only the cases that we are looking pole on. This is what this uh, experiment tells us. Uh, and so in order to uh, start comparing with observations, this is just a, a model for beta delta type. So what I do here is that I have a, a disk that is almost edge on, and then I assume that there's some extra emission, but it's not contained within the disk, but it has to be kind of like a jet or a wind. So this is the only way that I can reproduce this beta delta, delta uh, spectra. And whenever I go uh, with less or less uh, observer angle, I can reproduce these other two. These are actually the observations that I, I was trying to reproduce. So with the same disk, I can reproduce different types of X-ray spectrum from symbiotic stars. And I think it's interesting. I hope I convinced you. Um, so as a final remarks, let me just tell you that what I think I'm trying to convince you here is that the X-ray, the physics behind the X-ray uh, emission stars is exactly the same at the ends. So that means that we can we can try to propose a unified model for the extra emission from symbiotic star, which has been done, hasn't been done in the past. Uh, what what I, I noticed is that and demonstrated is that whenever you integrate all of the different different morphological features in a symbiotic star, you get this spectrum that you can see in unresolved point sources. And then, of course, the reflection uh, reproduces every, every, every line without the need to just only adding a Gaussian for, to fit the lines. So that's not a physically driven model. And that's it. But depending on the viewing angle and the physical uh, parameters that we have in our binary system, we can reproduce spectra from different types of symbiotic stars. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for the Jesus. Um, I was wondering because maybe I missed this today, but all the statistics of the observed um, symbiotic stars, how much are, how much, how many of them are classified as beta, how many of them are classified as beta delta? I mean, there is like an homogeneous distribution or there is a preferential group, I mean, so why? I think it's about 10, 20, 20, 20, or 20, 15, 20, something very homogeneous. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know the exact, num exact number. But both are kind of um, equally likely. Yeah, stat statistically yes. likely. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice talk. Uh, I have a, maybe I miss it, I don't know. So the point is in the production of the, say, the internet spectrum, the set. I I would like to you know, I mean, when you have uh, the accretion, there is a hot, hot spot in the accretion disk, isn't it? That's moving. Uh -huh. 
I asked is is that the, is that the scenario? So you have a, a creation hotspot which is moving in the it could the be a hotspot. That's what's producing the hot plasma. Okay. But that's what I, I am considering as the point source that releases yeah. the X-ray photons that go through the disk. But it could be, it, as, I, as I mentioned, it could be driven by a magnetic field, but it, it must be something that is shocking the gas on the surface of the water so, or on the way. So that should be, well, we have the, the disk, which is for the reflection. And then is there a hot spot when the, the matter which is shocking abrasion in the disk? And then the, the jet, isn't it? Yes. These are the three components. Yes. And then you play with that. So the point was, how, I mean, what would be the balance between and the jet in the global emission? It depends because some people have claimed that uh, this, some people have seen that this, uh, I didn't present it here, but I, I didn't have time to review it all. Okay. But some people have said, claimed that in some cases, in observations of the same source, this changes. So it means that the inner, hot gas is changing temperature, which means it is related with the accretion level of the source. That might be the source is in a higher state or when it's a lower state. So it, it might be related to the change in the higher energy range. Okay, so that was more or less the, the, the origin of the, the question was whether the other, the companion and the accretion rate can uh, some point yeah take it modulate yes the, yeah they can model and then in some cases they enter high state uh, uh even in the optical they go high by several magnitudes and then x-rays they change the plots so it's also an interplay in the binary okay, thanks any more questions uh Frank, is there any question on the no, no, no. okay uh, i have a couple of questions i must say I didn't see this work before this. Okay. It's, it's, it's really amazing. And I, I like it very much because I was working with symbiotic for some time and it will explain many of the things that you, you see there. As for our query, is there any evidence for a point source at the central star? It's X-ray spectrum is different to, to the spectrum of the jet? No, actually it's 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 a beta type, beta delta type, but as this soft emission, because at the end you do not resolve, and then even extracted the spectrum from the central source, you have some component from the jet, and you need the jet component of the thermal. So, so you're basically seeing the, the base. Of the yes. Okay. And then, uh, is there any information as for the orientation of the orbital plane of symbiotics? Maybe in some cases, you know that, it, that it, because there, there is occultation of the white world by the uh, uh -huh. red giant, and you know that this is quite uh, large there, yeah uh in those cases actually there's one case so where the x-ray spectrum varies with time and then one year disappears completely the source mm -hmm. and then another year appears again okay. so in that case it might be that we have a whole uh, uh contained this so that's when the hot spot of the accreting point is behind the red giant sky mm -hmm. but in the other ones we so far, I, I don't know because the disc, how flared the disc is, yeah. I, I don't know. So, the different uh, angles for the flare disc produce similar results as different inclination angles. Let me see. Different inclination. So, it's like this, it might be uh, two parameters that are related in order to fit the spectrum. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Please. Thank you for this nice and very clear story. I don't know if we have time to put again the slides of the white power model. <laughs> the hydro model. Yeah. The hydro model. <laughs> but I guess I have an alternative model to explain the morphology, but it's sort of nice, no? But you are assuming a fifth one component, which is the collimated jet, and it creates a span. But I guess it could be two components. You could imagine get in addition and a wind arising from the east, and it could explain also the morphology of the Yeah, so actually, uh, my model is driven by. <laughs> so I have a collaborator that has worked on Chandra observations, of this, or they have different Chandra observations from, I think, 10 years span. And they see actually the jets moving and expanding. Mm -hmm. So, but that it is not published work and it's not mine, so I didn't <laughs> present it here. Yeah, but they see that the actual jet is expanding. Okay. 
it moves. So that's it Super looks like this. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any evidence of a stellar wind there in the white world, like a, a, a physical files? I don't know. Because mm -hmm. it just may provide additional mm -hmm. information. But for the reflection model, I just need some hot component in the middle mm -hmm. in order to explain the rest of the features. So it could be produced by the accretion, by the wind, which might be extremely high velocity. There go very high temperature. I just need something that is in the middle produce producing the high X-rays, the hard X-rays. And then the rest is just because of the presence of the accretion. Because the stellar wind has components and also the winds. Mm. Yeah, but the, the wind might be blowing away in our case because white dwarf might have winds up to 4,000 kilometers per second. So that might be erasing the disk. So that actually might be the reason why we don't see other uh, symbiotic stars in X rays. <laughs> a uh, critical parameter of the model to actually fix or extract the inclination of the disk. So this is a toy model. This is just a flare disk. So I think the next step is to go through dynamical simulations. Okay. So actually there's people doing accretion onto white dwarfs by companions, like any companion, red, red, red giant companions. And they produce, they always produce kind of like a flare disk, but then the rest, might be a uh, ring like spiral, something 3D, or uh, uh, turbulent medium. So I think that's first the first way to go, to see if actual hydrodynamical simulations produce similar results. They actually, SCIRT can take a density result from hydrodynamical simulations and then produce its reflection. So that's the next step. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Huh? Okay, so let's dance again in Zeus, but this is Thank you. No, 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 no,